Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, producer and host. Over the last decade, homeschooling has grown in popularity. In fact, the U.S. Department of Education has shown that it's grown at a rate of over 60%, as many families are deciding that educating their children at home is better. Often, parents decide to homeschool as a result of peer pressure or bullying in schools, or maybe they want to accommodate children who have learning disabilities. Many parents believe that homeschooling is the smartest way to educate their children. But Harvard University has a different opinion. In Harvard Magazine's May-June 2020 issue, one Harvard Law School professor calls for a ban on homeschooling, saying homeschooling may keep children from, quote, contributing positively to a democratic society. This week, Carrie McDonald joins the podcast to respond. She's a senior education fellow at the Foundation for Economic Education, and her research interests include homeschooling and family and child policy. If you like this episode, don't forget to leave a like or a comment wherever you are listening and subscribe to the podcast. Act in Line is available on Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever podcasts are found. Today I'm speaking with Carrie McDonald, Senior Education Fellow at the Foundation for Economic Education, and she's also the author of Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom. She's also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute and a regular Forbes contributor. Carrie, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. So you are joining me today to talk about this um, recently published article in which Harvard leveled some pretty large attacks on homeschooling. They were pulling no punches and they they did not mince words. So first, let's talk about the article. It's titled, quote, The Risks of Homeschooling. And it's written by Aaron O'Donnell, who touts the work of one Harvard law professor who basically tries to make the case for outright banning homeschooling. Carrie, you are a Harvard alum and donor. So what was your first reaction to this piece? Well, I was shocked by how one-sided and misinformed the article was. You know, if you think about a magazine like Harvard Magazine that would pride itself with a reputation for editorial excellence, it was disappointing to see, um, again, such a, a misinformed article. And so I wrote a rebuttal, uh, you know, a letter to the editor in response to the Harvard Magazine article um, as an alum and also as a homeschooling mother of four children uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just down the road from uh, the main campus of Harvard. So, you know, I found it to be really shocking that this article um, would appear in the magazine and wanted to uh, really correct many of the mistruths that it spouted. Uh, and that's what I tried to do in my letter to the editor, which I then published at C.org. Now, I am not an expert, obviously, in law surrounding education and attacks that have been leveled at homeschooling in the past. Has anything like this ever come out of Harvard before? Well, the main um, professor that the article uh, widely quotes is a Harvard Law School professor who is known to be, who's known to call for presumptive bans on homeschooling. She's written extensively uh, in academic journals calling for this and and, and has some other um, sympathetic professors across the country who agree with her and believe that, you know, there's really the state's responsibility to protect children uh, and that that's not, you know, that 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 doesn't fall on parents. It's really an obligation of government um, to protect children and to um, ensure that that children are, you know, raised properly by whatever definition the state assumes that to be. Uh, and so there has been this criticism for a long time um, coming from that cohort of people who, you know, look for these, again, presumptive bans on homeschooling or heavy regulation of homeschooling. Um, there's an upcoming conference at Harvard in June that uh, gathers this group of people together, uh, invitation only 
conference to talk about increasing regulation or proposing bans on homeschooling. Um, and of course, it's you know certainly within their right to have an invitation only conference and to talk about you know issues that matter to them. I think what I found was that was surprising was that Harvard Magazine would again print such a one sided um, misinformed article. So in the article, it says that, quote, Elizabeth Bartholet sees risks for children and society in homeschooling and recommends a presumptive ban on the practice. Homeschooling, she says, not only violates children's right to a meaningful education and their right to be protected from potential child abuse, but may keep them from contributing positively to a democratic society. That is quite a mouthful, first of all. Um, And that makes quite a lot of claims. So let's dissect this a little bit more. You wrote a response, like you said, at Fee about, you know, some main problems that you see in this article that's been published by Harvard. So can you detail some of these for us? What are the biggest problems that you see um, in Elizabeth Bartlett's call? Well, I think the main issue is that they are worried about child abuse, and we all should be worried about child abuse, and we should absolutely be taking steps to prevent child abuse and to prosecute people who would abuse children. Um, The authors of the article, the author of the article and the Harvard Law School professor argue that this is why um, homeschooling should not exist or should be heavily regulated to prevent abuse. But there, you know, really isn't evidence to suggest that homeschoolers are abusing their children. Um, And to sort of claim that child abuse is rampant among homeschoolers is just factually incorrect and very troubling. Um, Now, they'll argue, well, if we send kids to school, there are these mandated reporters, teachers, and school administrators that are required by law to report potential abuse to authorities. And what I bring up in the article is that, you know, a lot of families will tell you that they choose to opt out of conventional schooling because of the widespread abuse that their children um, encounter daily at school, whether it's rampant bullying or even more tragically uh, abuse by teachers and school administrators. And we're often seeing headlines to this effect. And I linked to, to one from the Washington Post recently in my response article. So the idea that a child abuse is only happening in homes uh, and then this attack on homeschooling families as somehow being um, potential child abusers is just really such a vicious uh, an erroneous attack on what are, you know, for the most part, very law abiding families. Well, it stems right out of the belief that, you know, government and uh, people in positions of power are the number one guarantors of a child's safety. Right. And so there's an there's a quote that Professor Bartholet says in the article, um, and I quote this in my response as well. She says, I think it's always dangerous to put powerful people in charge of the powerless and to give the powerful ones total authority. And I responded that I agree with that. It's (laughs) just that she and I (laughs) see that power differential um, quite differently, that she's concerned with families having this power. And I'm concerned with giving that power to government um, and and making families be the powerless ones. So I think it's just looking at two sides of the issue. Um, But right, she and and this article are definitely looking at this kind of proactive role of government, that government is the one shaping society, um, that they are sort of the philosopher kings who will guide children and uh, shape them into whatever you know form they believe is is valid and valuable, uh, and and that shouldn't and they're arguing that shouldn't be left to children. That really the state knows better. And I and I just there's just so much in the article that I find really concerning. You know, in particular where Barthollet talks about as her rationale for sending children to school and banning homeschooling is, um, you know, really this belief that, and she says that it's important for children to grow up exposed to community values, social values, democratic values, ideas about non-discrimination and tolerance of other people's viewpoints. This is what she says in the article. And yet she the, it's so intolerant toward uh, a different way of living and, and viewing the world in terms of homeschooling or or, you know, not believing that that state 
mandated or state supported education is, you know, the only way to go. Um, so, you know, in trying to sound so open minded, I think, and, and so um, above the above the bar, I think it comes across actually as quite the opposite as being very myopic and ignorant toward other people's viewpoints uh, and hostile really toward them. And then on that point in particular, and, and, and just to elaborate a little bit more on this idea that that somehow uh, homeschoolers are being sheltered from diverse viewpoints and from their community, I mean, there's widespread evidence to suggest that that's just not the case. Uh, peer-reviewed, re- you know, journal articles that talk about how homeschoolers are actually more connected to their communities. They have more community involvement, um, engagement in extracurricular activities, engagement in volunteer activities, more civic mindedness, more open mindedness even because they are, you know, spending their days outside uh, interacting with all sorts of different community members and not in sort of these age segregated conventional public school classrooms. Um, And that reinforces you know, are this this particular finding about the civic engagement, enhanced civic engagement of homeschoolers, um, echoes similar research on private education more broadly, more generally, that also suggests positive uh, civic engagement and outcomes um, through private education. Well, several studies prove that, you know, homeschooling um, or homeschooled children end up having higher standardized testing results. <laughs> and I mean, you have to ask yourself, how many students at Harvard have been homeschooled? Right. So I do link in in my response to a 2018 article by the Harvard Gazette and the Harvard Crimson has written, you know, previous articles about uh, current Harvard homeschool students. Uh, In this particular 2018 Gazette article, um, they spotlighted three students who really were homeschooled in a a very unstructured, informal, self-directed way. They were allowed to kind of guide their own learning. They took classes that interested them. They were able to um, follow their interests and pursue their passions and ended up at Harvard. And in the article, I quote from the article saying that this spirit of curiosity and independence continues to shape their education. Um, you know, these are the kinds of people you would you would expect to, um, you know, be furthering their education and, and seizing, you know, new opportunities to learn and discover and explore. Uh, and it was really quite a, a wonderful article about how homeschooling was the, was the source of a lot of that curiosity and independence for these particular students. And so um, it did seem, again, sort of unusual that Harvard Magazine would choose to just focus on what they see as these potential risks of homeschooling without acknowledging the many uh, homeschooled students that have attended Harvard, that have graduated from Harvard, um, uh, or in my case, alumni who are now homeschooling our own children. It just seemed a little bit um, bizarre that they wouldn't, you know, include the benefits uh, as well as potential risks and really create what would be a much more editorially honest article. Well, speaking about editorial honesty, this article makes the statement that, quote, up to 90 percent of today's homeschooling families are apparently driven by conservative Christian beliefs, which, first of all, isn't true, like you point out and we'll get to also. But second of all, you know, even if they were, so what? (laughs) Which just exposes the fact that you said this is driven in part by refusal to be tolerant of pluralism and ideas that differ from your own. Um, But let's go back to that point that is just simply not true that up to 90% of today's homeschooling families are as she wants to uh, label white and Christian. So can you shed some light on that for us? What do homeschool families look like today? Right. I thought this was one of the more incorrect um, points in the Harvard Magazine article that is just verifiably false. Um, they were really trying to paint this stereotypical picture of the typical homeschooler as sort of a white evangelical Christian. And and to your point, and saying that somehow that's what makes it so bad and that's why it should be regulated, which, you know, to, again, what you're saying is who says that why, why is that, you know, why would that be bad? Um, but even beyond that attack, I think, really on Christian families choosing to homeschool, the data just don't support that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's better data show that it's about two thirds of today's nearly two million homeschoolers um, identify as Christian. 
Uh, and that's about equal to the U.S. population as a whole. About two thirds of Americans consider themselves Christian. Um, but the homeschooling population is becoming increasingly diverse ideologically and demographically. So it is true that much of the growth in the modern homeschooling movement occurred in, in particular in the 1980s and 1990s, led by conservative Christians who were opting out of conventional schooling. Um, and that got us to about 850,000 homeschoolers in 1999. And I think you could argue that at that time, um, the vast majority of them were Christian, considered themselves Christian homeschoolers. That, you know, continues to evolve as numbers of homeschoolers skyrocket in this country. And while, again, the majority of homeschoolers today would still consider themselves to be Christian, again, reflective of the larger American population, it is not the primary motivator for these families to choose homeschooling. Um, The federal data from the U.S. Department of Education, the most recent data on homeschooling, identify concern about the school environment, such as safety drugs and negative peer pressure, as the top motivator for families choosing the homeschooling option. And this exceeds other factors, such as a desire for religious or moral instruction. Um, So it's just not the case that homeschoolers today are choosing to homeschool because of of Christian beliefs. They may be Christian, but that is not the primary motivator for them. Uh, And then you also find really that the most growth in the modern homeschooling um, movement is being driven by urban secular parents who are disillusioned with the test-driven, one-size-fits-all mass schooling model and really want a much more tailored, individualized learning environment for their children. Um, And then again, you also find that this idea that it's, uh, you know, sort of only white parents that are homeschooling is not backed up by the facts that the the population or the percentage of black homeschoolers doubled between 2007 and 2012 to 8% of the overall homeschool population. And the percentage of of Hispanic homeschoolers is 25% of the overall uh, homeschool population in the U.S., yeah. In some ways, I think this article also reveals um, at the heart of it a kind of a bias against the family unit rather than just homeschooling. It seems the crux of the issue here is the debate over the question of, you know, who does the child first and foremost belong to and who has their best interest in mind? Bartholet says, quote, the issue is, do we think that parents should have 24-7 essentially authoritarian control over their children from ages 0 to 18? She says, I think that's dangerous. I think it's always dangerous to put powerful people, like you said, in charge of the powerless and to give the powerful ones total authority. Um, I mean, at, at the heart of this, I think she just doesn't want the family unit, it sounds like, having control over children. Right. I think it's really a battle between the family and the state. Um, and, you know, I would argue that the state is much more authoritarian. I mean, you look at public schools specifically, they are compulsory. Parents must uh, comply with compulsory attendance laws under a legal threat of force. Now, they can in all states currently opt out and homeschool their children in accordance with state regulations, which vary. Um, but the, the most children, the vast majority of American children are uh, educated in a compulsory public schooling classroom. Um, if you talk about authoritarianism, I would argue that that is, large, is a bigger threat than um, families who, you know, evolutionarily have a vested interest in their child's development and in their child's well-being and caring for them and nurturing them. Um, and, you know, to this idea that you have to um, send your child to a public school so that they can be properly educated, properly socialized, so that they can have this pluralistic worldview is incorrect. And obviously, you know, as we pick up in this particular article is also hypocritical because, um, you know, the professor and others are basically being very myopic and and not at all um, embracing of different viewpoints and values. You mentioned there that state regulations um, around homeschooling do vary. So can you shed some more light on that? What do current regulations around homeschooling look like? Right. So I can go back a little bit historically. The modern homeschooling movement really began um, in force in the late 1970s. 
And at the time, homeschooling was not legal in all states, or if it were was legal, it was sort of fuzzy. It wasn't clear uh, at the local or state level what parents' rights were around homeschooling. And so a lot of parents at the time, in the 1970s and throughout the 1980s, were really persecuted for choosing to remove their children from school. Um, and there were extensive court battles that ultimately led to homeschooling being legally recognized in all 50 states by 1993. Um, now those regulations do vary by state. So you do have some states that have no regulations for homeschooling families. You have some states that have um, minimal regulations. Maybe you have to inform your local school district or send a letter to the state saying that you're homeschooling, but there's not a lot of oversight. And then you have more heavily regulated states where um, young people are required to submit curriculum and to have teacher assessments or to take standardized tests. Uh, so it really does vary by state. And, you know, I would argue that those battles should occur within those states, that this is a local issue uh, or, a, you know, a state level issue for, you know, states to decide what they believe is appropriate and, and what families believe is appropriate in those particular places. Now, it would seem to me with the number of growing families choosing to homeschool their children and with the growing diversity, like you said, there are in homeschooling families, advocating for regulations around homeschooling wouldn't be, you know, at all embraced by most communities, I would think. How settled are these current laws and regulations around homeschooling? I mean, is there anything to really fear here? I think the trend has been toward loosening regulations. Um, you know, anytime you see calls at the policy level, at the legislative level, at the in these states for increasing oversight of homeschooling families, um, very often legislature offices will be inundated with calls and visits from homeschooling parents. Um, you know, there was an effort not that long ago in California to really crack down on homeschoolers uh, in the wake of what was a, a, a horrific child abuse case, but had nothing to do with homeschooling. It was really, um, it was just really an egregious instance of, of parental child abuse uh, and was rightfully prosecuted. But as a result of that, there were calls to uh, heavily regulate and monitor homeschooling families under this false belief that homeschoolers are um, homeschooling in order to um, hide child abuse, which is just completely incorrect. And in that case in California, um, there were lines and lines of homeschooling parents that flooded the state capitol um, in protest of these calls for increased regulations of homeschoolers, and it ultimately ended up not passing. Any of this legislation didn't pass. And I think you find that to be the case. So it is true that homeschoolers, you know, for the most part, are very protective of their rights to educate their children as they see fit and will stand up for that right uh, when there is policy calls for, um, you know, again, increased regulation or in this case, presumptive bans on the practice. So I think that's hopeful, both in seeing, you know, the ways in which homeschoolers really do protect their rights and also the state trends toward uh, loosening regulations. I'm going to switch gears here because I want to talk about the larger context surrounding this piece. We were talking before we began recording here that it seems um, conveniently coincidental that this piece has been published right now during the coronavirus pandemic, while many families are being kept at home and being forced to at least partially homeschool. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Right. I'll say a couple of things. One is um, I think it's fairly um, true to say that it's likely this article was in the queue to be published long before COVID-19 impacted us. Um, just in thinking about their, you know, the editorial cycle at the magazine, I think that's probably fair to say. Um, but I think that there is probably concern, particularly among these op opponents, these vocal opponents of homeschooling, that as families get a taste of learning without schooling and living and learning alongside their children outside of a conventional classroom, that it could lead to more parents choosing this option. And of course, that would be a threat to people who want to regu heavily regulate or ban this practice. 
Um, I, I like to preface this by saying that what we're all experiencing right now during the pandemic is nothing like authentic homeschooling. I mean, this is forced school at home. It's crisis schooling is what it's been called. Um, it is not at all what we would think of as typical homeschooling. Being isolated from our communities is not what homeschooling is like today, despite what these opponents would like to, you know, indicate or paint the picture that that's so. Um, you know, most homeschoolers, for example, will tell you they spend most of their, more of their time outside of their homes than inside of their homes, really being immersed in the people, places, and things of their community authentically. Um, and that, of course, isn't happening right now for any of us. We're all stuck inside and distanced from our community. Um, that being said, though, I do think that there will be families who find this experience quite enlightening. Maybe they have been intrigued by the idea of homeschooling or virtual schooling or some other alternative to school and just never had the inertia to make it happen. They never really were able to take the leap. And now they are getting a glimpse of what it could be like to learn in a different way with their children. Maybe they're finding that their kids are a lot calmer outside of school. Maybe they're a lot happier because they're not being bullied um, or they're not, um, you know, being forced to uh, consume a standardized curriculum that is completely disconnected from their interests and motivations. Um, there was a Yale study, for example, that just came out that's actually published this month that showed that 75% of American high school students are unhappy at school. It was sort of this overwhelming dissatisfaction with being at school. And so maybe parents are finding, wow, my kids are now outside of school. They're calmer, they're happier, they're more relaxed. Oh, and maybe they're also rekindling some of that natural curiosity and drive for learning that, of course, we see all the time in young children, but that can often be stifled as children go through a compulsory system of mass schooling. So I'm wondering, you know, considering all of those things, what do you think that this piece from Harvard says about higher education? Because I think in many ways, Harvard is really just exposing how out of touch they are. And it's a reflection of the homogenous thinking in so many universities. Yeah, I'm not sure that I'm prepared to say that this one article is an indictment on higher education. I think that um, we should be looking very closely at higher education. Um, we should certainly be looking at fund, you know, federal uh, and taxpayer funding toward higher education as an issue. Um, the reality is that, you know, colleges and universities are their own market. You know, people decide whether or not to attend, uh, decide whether or not to apply. I think that the, the real issue is, you know, in terms of how taxpayers might be funding some of these institutions. And that is something we should look at, because if we do feel like there is a sort of one-sidedness to higher education, then we should really be um, concerned with taxpayer money going to support that kind of thing. Well, you know, speaking about uh, funding to higher education, I feel it would be inappropriate to not mention here that this article has been published almost in conjunction with the fact that Harvard um, has just received $8.7 million in federal aid um, bailout money as a result of COVID-19, while, you know, so many 22 million unemployed Americans are still waiting for stimulus checks. Yeah, and I think it gets back to, again, if, if, if higher education does receive taxpayer money, then it needs to be more reflective of um, American taxpayers. And it needs to do exactly what Bartholet's saying is have tolerance of other people's viewpoints, her words. Uh, and so, you know, that's what we would expect from uh, in, an institution that's receiving taxpayer funds. Um, and that's where I do think we absolutely have to call out these institutions when they are not living up to what they express as their, you know, principles. Carrie, where can our listeners go to find more information on education and to learn more about your work? Yes, please visit me at the Foundation for Economic Education, c.org slash Kerry, K-E-R-R-Y. Uh, there you'll see links to all of my articles, links to my book, uh, links to all my social media accounts, and go ahead and send me an email as well. All right, Carrie, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. As always, thank you so much for listening today. Our podcast team loves putting the show together for you every week, and it's so encouraging to hear back from our listeners. 
Feedback is super important to me because it lets me know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most, and also how I can improve this show to make sure you're getting the most out of it. You can reach our team at actinline at actin.org, or you can call our office at 616-454-3080. And if you like our show, you know what to do. Leave us those ratings and reviews on the Apple Podcast app and subscribe. Act in Line is on YouTube, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. 